So 10 years ago, we um, scientists um, finished the first draft of the human genome. And kind of along with that, there was this expectation that doctors, researchers would be able to use that almost immediately in medical applications and start using that, using the term personal genomics is a term that we use a lot, and that that would be leading to a lot of breakthrough cures as we understand our genome. In the, in the 10 years since then, we've kind of learned that that, that was a little premature. But um, what's, what's, what's really neat is that a lot of technology has advanced in, the, in, in that time frame and given us a really clear path for kind of how we're going to be going into that direction. So I'm going to be talking a lot today about where, what we can do today and where we need to go in the future to start to realize this goal of personal genomics and personalized medicine. So, so the, first, the first human genome project, um, the, the, the big human genome project, took about 10 years of time. It was started in the early 90s, used thousands and thousands of sequencing instruments in rooms that looked a lot like this, cost about $3 billion, and generated about seven times the coverage of a single human genome. So a single human genome contains about 3 billion base pairs of data. And they had to sequence it about seven times to come up with a really accurate representation of one person's genome. Today, we actually have a really scaled this down a lot. So we can actually do the same thing in about two weeks' time with about $6,000 on one instrument. Wow. So this is the type of thing where I can go back to my office tomorrow and start sequencing a genome and have it done in about, have it off the instrument in about two weeks. So this is just an amazing reduction in the amount of time and cost it takes to do this. So to kind of understand and put this in perspective, of medicine and, and a lot of and those challenges that we still have. I'm going to take a step back. We're going to do a little science lesson here, so I hope everyone's coffee has kicked in today. Um, this will be um, high school level biology, maybe, <laughs> hopefully. So um, if you remember your, your basic biology, every cell in our body contains a set of chromosomes. And these chromosomes actually hold the DNA that makes up the code of our life. And if you start looking down and unraveling, unraveling the DNA, you can kind of see a chromosome is a nice, tightly packed structure. It comes out. And at the very end, you have all of these little base pairs. And these are the A's, G's, C's, and T's that we're used to seeing when we talk about DNA. Now, this is the code. So this is the blueprint for life and how it works. What actually goes on inside of a cell is this DNA is, is read, off of, read off of the chromosomes and converted into RNA. These little RNA elements then float around inside the cell and perform a number of different functions. One of the functions, and one of the most important functions, is they are converted one more time into proteins. And proteins kind of form the structure of the cell and perform a lot of the heavy lifting in the cell. So if you can imagine a building needs to be the structural components of a building. All of that type of stuff. This is what proteins do. And there's a direct path from DNA to RNA to proteins. And this is what we've traditionally understood as genomics. It turns out that all of the RNA inside the cell <coughs> also has a lot of other functions. So it can regulate protein. It can amplify expression. It can inhibit expression. And expression is just basically the act of translating um, DNA to RNA, and it's being expressed inside of a cell. So that's actually the basics of genomics right there. This is how our cells work at the most fundamental level. Everything else that becomes us starts off at this and, and is emergent from these properties. Now, what's really exciting about all of this is that if, if everyone's genomic code was exactly the same, we'd all kind of function and look very similar. But variety is actually what makes us all different. And variety also is one of the most important applications in understanding how to apply this in, in a medical space. So variety occurs in, in our genomic code at a number of different levels. At the chromosome level, we can actually have very large rearrangements in the chromosome. So we can have big sections of the chromosome copied multiple times. We can have parts of it swiped out. So this could be very large. So hundreds of base pairs or thousands of base pairs can be removed in, my, in me, yet still be present in you. This is actually turning out to be a very important part of cancer study right here. So they're understanding that a lot of these high-level rearrangements of our chromosomes are responsible for a lot of the disease states in cell. And the more that we can understand and measure these, the more we can start to address the, the root causes of cancer and develop treatments for it. Another um, type of, type of um, variation that you've probably heard about a lot recently is called epigenetics. And epi just means on the outside. So these are modifications that can happen to the outside of your chromosomes. Um, in this case, we can see there are some chemical, chemicals attached to the outside, outside of the chromosome here that's preventing it from acting. And these are just modifications. They can happen um, while you're alive. So these are, these are actually very microevolutionary changes. So you can see these types of things happen in cells over, on your bodies over a couple weeks' time. They can be passed on a few generations, but they tend not to be the big long-term evolutionary changes that give rise to a lot of the variety between species. Um, this, this just affects individuals over a few generations or just a few weeks in their life. Finally, the um, types of evolutionary changes we're um, familiar with most of the time, and the font changed here a little bit, so pretend those are all lined up, um, is, is, is individual changes to the genome. So the top genome here, you can picture that's my genome, and the bottom one here would be yours. And you can see at this position right here, I have an A. At that position, 
you have a G. And this gives rise to a lot of the little varieties that you know, might predispose me towards a certain disease and not you. Um, but this is the, these are the important things that happen on a very macroevolutionary scale. And what's really exciting about all of these types of changes is the first human genome project started to suggest that these exist. And we've known parts of them, like the little changes we've understood for a while, but the bigger changes we're really only starting to understand how, how they work in life. And it was only that scaling down of the sequencing process that I showed in the first slide that's really allowed us to start measuring this in incredible detail. So now we can actually measure every one of these things. I could pull a sample out of my body today, and we can start looking at the, the large copy changes in my cell. We could look at epigenetic changes, and we could look at a lot of the small, other small changes. So all of the measurement tools are actually starting to be in place now that are going to be enabling personalized genomics. So we can start to you know, picture now in the future what, what a trip to the doctor might look like. So given that there are relationships between a lot of these and disease states, and a lot of this stuff can happen at various parts in our life, you can imagine now, you go into a doctor's office, they can take a sample from you and look at all of these things. So they can take a sequencing instrument and just run it like they would do any, any other lab test. So the, the procedure that um, I'm going to outline the procedure here, one of the common ones that's talked about in personalized genomics that, that we'll, we'll probably be seeing in the future. The first step um, in this procedure is going to be an acquire, to acquire a reference. And, and the whole idea of a reference is we need to know what a healthy genome looks like. So we need to know what your genome looks like when it's healthy or maybe what, you know, from your what, what a public genome, what the human genome looks like. Um, we have James Watson here. He is one of the current public genomes that we have. I could be taking a sample for myself that I carry along with my medical record. That could be my reference genome. Or we could just com compare it to cells in my body at a given time. So I could have a cancer cell in my body and then a healthy cell. And we want to see how the genomes have changed between those two cells. So the, most, the first step we're going to do is find out what's the base case that we're looking against here. The next step a doctor is going to perform is to sequence the disease genome. So we'll take a sample from the cell and go ahead and get, get the entire structure, find out what all three billion base pairs look like in the disease cell. The next thing we'll do is, of course, look at what's going on. So this is looking at the RNA. This is the expression. So this is all, all of those little yellow things I showed earlier that are moving around the cell, performing a lot of the functions of the cell. We want to see what's happening. So we want to see what, what's going on inside that cell. And this will give us a very clear picture of everything that's going on in that cell at the moment at, at that level. And then, of course, we'll take that data, map it back to our genome. So that's basically taking it and identifying where each RNA came from on the genome. And that will give us all of the information that a doctor will need to start creating a very clear picture of the activity inside that cell at a time that will give you a, a really good understanding of what's going on and possibly identify treatments um, and help diagnose any disease state. So it's kind of, it seems kind of straightforward. And, you know, me, um, I have, I'm a computer scientist with a software background. and I. I kind of love this because it, it looks like debugging software to me. I, I, you know, I have the source code. I can run it. I can see what's happening. And, and you know, for me, this makes a lot of sense. So you know, my, my, my main question you know, when I first started working in this field is, OK, lost a slide here. Anyway, so, so my first question was, of course, you know, where do I sign up for this? You know, I, I'd love to you know, get a hold of an instrument, put it in my garage, and you know, just start messing with my, with my genome and understand how I work. <laughs> um, uh, of course, there's the, the, the other half of it, too, that I, you know, as a computer scientist, I'm like, well, this is really cool. How come, how come we're not doing it? What is the catch? And unfortunately, there's a, there's a small catch to all of this right now. So if we, if we go back and look at the, um, the process again, we're going we're gonna to look at this more from an informatics perspective. So kind of understand the scale of, of, of data that we're going to be dealing with to understand humanity here. So, so the first step, of course, is acquiring the reference. These will most likely come from a public, a public database. Um, we'll, we'll have a a lot of reference, healthy, healthy references, representative of different social groups, different populations in different areas, and probably your personal medical record will carry around a, re a reference genome for yourself, too. So you'll be pulling that around. This is about 10 gigabytes of data, and to put that in layman's terms, we're two to three high-definition movies is about how much a single re genome reference is going to require. The, the next step is one of the compute-intensive steps, and this is also a very data-intensive step. So 100 billion base pairs of data is about the, the amount we need right now to create this reference, to create a reference of a disease genome. And that, that's about 50 to 100 gigabytes of data. And to assemble all of that information into a reference that we can actually use is going to take about 36 hours on a reasonably sized collection of compute servers. Um, what, what's interesting about this is the problem here is actually very similar to creating a large document index. So if you can imagine you have a billion documents that you want to search and you have to create an index of those documents, that's actually computationally, this is a very similar problem. And so this is very similar to recreating 6% of Google's index every time that you want to create a reference for a genome. Um, on the searching side, so when we have all of the RNA that was transcribed and we want to look and see what it's doing, we have a similar operations because the first step, of course, there is to take that RNA and map it back to 
the healthy to the, to the genome that you're looking at. So there's about 15 billion search operations that you're going to have to perform there um, to annotate a, a couple million features that a doctor will be looking at. Those search operations actually, based on the best number I could find, which was about 500 million search operations a day from Google's main page, is about 30 times the daily search traffic on Google. And then there's the whole interpretation step. So this is um, where we're actually going to have a very highly skilled doctor involved, and this is going to be a new medical profession, I'm sure, in the future. Sometimes it's referred to as genomic pathology. Um, but there will be a doctor involved here who will have to come in and understand genomics. And to compare it to um, another area where another data intensive medical profession is radiology. So in, th there are some subtle differences, or actually some not, not so subtle differences here. Radiology um, is, is very image based, it's very context based. A radiologist looks at, a, looks at an image from a, from a patient's body. And it, in this case, we're looking at a knee here. It's, it's, there's, there's a natural context to bring it back to. So the interpretation is, you know, understanding what you're looking at, you know, anatomically and then making a, making a decision based on that. Genomic data is about as far removed from images as you can get. It's A's, G's, C's, and T's. It, it really is at that level. Um, it's a lot of complex social network type diagrams. We have these very, very big interaction systems where you have proteins interacting with RNAs. And those are very, those are very hard to mine. So if you've ever tried to mine your social network for information, imagine trying to do that with a hundred, with a hundred million friends and trying to understand the patterns there. Um, so the data, <coughs> the data analysis side is, is definitely going to be challenging and it's going to require highly skilled medical practitioners here. Now, of course, what I was just talking about was when I go to the doctor, this is one sample, this is me going in one day. So now to go on the play big side of it, what happens when we're doing a million samples a day, when this is a normal clinical procedure? The numbers get a little bigger. So the, the amount of reference traffic that will be moving around the internet from the public repositories or from your medical record repositories is going to be about a petabyte of data a day. This is about a billion YouTube videos that will be moving around a day, just, just the, basic, the, the basic information. <laughs> the computational steps are actually scale in a similar manner. So we'll require about four million servers to process a day's worth of, of genomic data. Um, that's about as much as many servers as are sold yearly, globally. So if we tell everyone to stop buying servers for a year, we can build this up in about a year. <laughs> um, it'll, it'll require about 72 million hours of, of compute time to, to process the data using our current technologies, which if you take the UT Ranger supercomputer, which is one of the fastest in the world right now, that would take about three years time on that computer to process the data from a single day of clinical genomics. And of course, we will be generating all this data. Um, the entire data, data generated from about a million samples will be on the order of an exabyte of data a day. If you kind of know the data hierarchy, you know, it starts with megabytes, gigabytes, terabytes, petabytes, exabytes. So we're at one with 15 zeros following it is what that number is. Um, that's about the amount of data generated by the Large Hadron Collider, the largest physics experiment in the world in a year. So we're looking, you know, at 20 to 30 percent more than that that will be generated yearly in clinical genomics. And, and finally, we do have the interpretation step again, and this is, again, a very, going to be a very highly skilled medical profession. Um, and again, we'll need a practitioner who can, who can understand all of this data and spend some time with it. Currently, there are about 27,000 radiologists in the United States. And, you know, they spend, you know, 20 minutes, an hour, you know, a certain amount of time on each image. But they do, they do have to work through it fairly quickly. And as we mentioned, processing and understanding genomic data is very, is very different. And currently, it takes us, you know, weeks to go sift through the data sets and understand it. So hopefully, we'll be able to scale it down to where doctors can understand that data in a reasonable amount of time. But I, I suspect we may need more than 27,000 of them to process this number. So every 10 years or so, we've kind of come up with this promise of personalized medicine. It's, it, it, it keeps reoccurring. Um, early on, the, the challenge was just basic sequencing. But chemists and biologists, you know, needed to figure out how to understand the sequencing. When we started the human genome project then in the 90s, it became more of an informatics challenge, but for a single genome. We, informatics science biologists did a great job of solving that problem, and, it, and we got the first human genome. And in the last 10 years, we've done a really good job of scaling the tech sequencing technology down. So the next challenge now is really looking and scaling up the data technology. This is, this is where, the, where the opportunity is for the next 10 years, and what will make it so 10 years from now, I won't be giving the same talk that we're still 10 years away from it. And, and I think, you know, looking at, looking at the, the path to it, um, we're, we're really looking at taking all, all, everything that we've learned in large search engines, large social networking sites, all of that ideas, all the ideas we've generated there for managing that scale of data and bringing it back into science. So this is 
where you know, we'll take all of those Google ideas, bring it back into medicine, bring it back, and start building out the infrastructure to do this. And I, I, I firmly believe this is possible. And I think you know, we'll be seeing in the next 10 years, we'll be seeing this problem solved. And hopefully this is the last one. And we'll be, start seeing this in the clinic. So thank you. <laughs>